This video is going to take an in-depth look at X-Sabers. X-Sabers are a combo-oriented deck that abuse the raw strength of their monster's unique effects to set up some of the most powerful extensions Tengu Plant format has to offer. Now, X-Sabers is probably one of the most unique archetypes in Tengu Plant format in the sense that literally every single monster in the archetype is just good. Like, majority of the monsters you're going to see play have absurdly good effects for its own archetype, and I don't think there has conceivably been an archetype that has this much raw strength just from their individual monsters up to this point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history. This, this card, this deck has so much utility in its just main deck monsters, and we're going to start by talking about Dark Soul. Dark Soul is a very unique monster in this format in the sense that it was ruled differently back then than what it is today, which means when you're playing Tengu Plant format, you're going to play how it was. Was ruled in the past and so the effect of dark soul is pretty simple it's during the end phase of this card was sent to the grave from your side of the field to the graveyard this turn you can add one x saber monster from your deck to your hand so pretty simple but how it works in tengu plant format is for every time it was sent from field to graveyard in that turn you get a search and the other thing to think about is this card doesn't require it to be in the graveyard at resolution it activates in the graveyard but it doesn't care where its location is at resolution of the card so if your opponent dd crows it or if you monster reborn it or bring it back in some other way it still will resolve during the end phase because the game remembers that it was sent from field to the graveyard. And that's just how it was ruled back then. This can allow you to, you could effectively send it to the, from the field to the graveyard, pot of avarice back, draw into it, and then search the same copy or something. You know, the, the, all kinds of crazy stuff can come from this. But the rule, the main rule to focus on is the fact that this gets multiple searches in the end phase, which means you can see games where this gets like three searches in a single end phase, even four, and it can go really, really crazy. So this is the bread and butter. This is the card you're going to be playing around in virtually every single game. And we'll kind of talk about what other cards go along with this to supplement it. So we'll first talk about the level two tuner of the deck, which is X-Saber Pashul. This card goes really crazy. Its effect is this card cannot be destroyed by battle. And then during each of your opponent's standby phases, you take 1,000 damage. You must control this face-up defense position card to activate and resolve this effect. So basically, if you have it in defense as your stall tool, it does have a bit of a cost, which is you'll take 1,000 damage each turn. But that's honestly not that big a deal because it's also during your opponent's standby phases. So if you summon this during your opponent's end phase through the likes of a card like Reinforced Truth, then you're not even really going to see much of much damage from it unless you leave it on the field a full extra turn or if your opponent attacks into it while it's set and it flips up you're not going to see any damage from that either which is why this card is just uniquely a very powerful stall tool that not many archetype cards get just the fact that it says that it <laughs> can't be destroyed by battle so going alongside that we also want to talk about x saber fall troll so this is like the boss monster of the deck that the boss main deck monster i guess you could say and it says cannot be normal summoned or set must be special summoned from your hand by controlling two or more face up x saber monsters and they cannot be special summoned by other ways once per turn you can target one level four lower x saber monster in your graveyard special summon that target so you need the only way to summon this is from your hand by having two face up x saber monsters so when you have a card like pashul on your board that becomes really really easy when you have have something that can't be destroyed by battle it means that meeting these requirements is really easy and the fact that this can bring back a monster from the grave like dark soul now you can kind of start to see where these combos ensue and so those are the main cards that you're kind of using but then we also have other cards that supplement this strategy such as x saber bogart knight which is when this card is summoned, you can special summon one level four lower X Saber monster from your hand. And then it has effect that says cannot be used as a synchro material, except for the synchro summon of an X Saber synchro monster. Typically in modern iterations of X Sabers, you're not seeing this card exceed two copies. My personal recommendation is to only run it as a one of, because while it does have 1900 attack, it also is the most vulnerable to like hand traps. And I'd say it's just not that good. It's like to see outside of the fact that it can crash with the Thunder King. It doesn't really accomplish all that much, which is why I'm just personally not a fan of Bogart Knight. It is worth running, but you only typically want to use this when you search it off of a Dark Soul and then you want to use it to set up a Fall Troll play on the following turn. So I would be kind of careful with this card. A lot of people get baited and see the 1900 attack and think it's worth running multiples of. It's really not. It's definitely better as a one of. And then this is probably the best tuner in the entire deck which is x saber full helm knight 
This card is so powerful and you're typically going to see it ran at two to three copies, but its effect is when your opponent's monster declares an attack, you can target the attacking monster and negate that attack. And this effect can only be used once while this card is face up on the field. If this card destroys an opponent's defense position monster by battle, you can target one level four lower X Saber monster in your graveyard and special summon it. The thing about this that makes this so powerful is this card doesn't have to stay on the field to resolve. Xaber Full Home Knight could attack into a Raikou, get popped by that Raikou, and then still target itself in the graveyard to bring back. This card basically chews through anything when it's swinging over a defense position monster, which is why this card is just so strong. And the fact that it can negate an attack is also a really powerful tool. The one unique thing about X Sabers is sometimes the tuner and non-tuner or the materials are sometimes even stronger than making a synchro monster itself. There's, I find myself while playing this deck a lot of time, just leaving a full Helm Knight on field, even though I could synchro, just because it's better to have the full Helm Knight to negate an attack on your opponent's turn than it is to synchro into something that's like kind of big. And then the last card I wanna talk about that you'll commonly see played in the main deck is going to be X Saber Emmer's Blade. This card says, when this card is destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard, you can special summon one level four X Saber monster from your deck. So it's basically like a giant rat, but better because you can put them in defense. This card is also insanely powerful. The fact that it really doesn't have a lot of limitations and you can literally just go from this being destroyed by battle to special summoning a Paschal. It just means that you have so many tools to stall out the game with these cards and easily set up two monsters on the field for the likes of your Fall Troll. So those are the primary monsters you're gonna see played in virtually every X Saber deck, but there are a few other monsters that are probably worth mentioning, so we'll kind of look at those as well. So the first monster is going to be X Saber Air Bellum. This card is played in a lot of more retro formats, um, like further back, but it's not necessarily nearly as good as it was back then. This card basically says if it inflicts battle damage to your opponent by a direct attack, discard one random card from your opponent's hand. So that effect is really nice, especially if you're doing creature swap plays with the likes of Emmer's Blade. But for the most part, as a standalone monster, it's just really not that great. And when you have other monsters to use your normal summon on, such as Dark Soul or even Full Helm Knight, it just feels like the most underwhelming out of the group. So you're typically not seeing people run this card, even though it could conceivably be strong as like maybe a one of at best um but for the most part i personally stay away from it and i know a lot of others do as well and then the other card to talk about is going to be x saber raggy gura this card in conjunction with the synchro x saber Gotems is really powerful in the sense that you can use this with Gotems as well as fall troll and you can set up a hand loop and maybe we'll go into that combo a little bit later uh it's it's a little difficult to pull off and it's certainly not something you're really going to see turn one in most cases but it could in theory work so yeah that is an option but i would say for the most part raggy gura just isn't all that great but aside from those maybe we should talk about the synchro monsters so x sabers has a lot of unique synchro monsters in their archetype the first one's going to be x saber Gotems. it's a level nine synchro and it has one of the most unique summoning requirements out of any synchro monster in the sense that it says it needs one tuner or one or more earth monsters it doesn't say it needs a non-tuner earth monster so you can synchro with multiple tuners with this card which is super bizarre uh and it also doesn't need like a ton of materials you can basically synchro a six and a three and get there a lot of times you're seeing this made with fall troll plus a full home knight but yeah, this, this card's really unique, and then it also has the effect of you contribute one X Saber monster to discard one random card from your opponent's hand, and that's not a once per turn effect. So if you can summon a bunch of X Sabers, you can take cards out of your opponent's hand, which is really, really nice because it gives you counterplay to a lot of things like Gores, for example. And so yeah, this card is really, really powerful, and it also has 3,100 attack, which is like one of the highest attack monsters in the entire, like in the entire meta game of Tengu Plant format. Like 3,100 is really high for a boss monster. So that's really cool in itself. Another synchro that they have access to is going to be X Saber Urbellum. This is a level seven and it's not crazy. This card has the effect when it inflicts battle damage while they have four to your opponent while they have four or more cards in their hand, place one random card from their hand on top of your their deck. So you effectively skip a draw phase with this card if they have four or more cards in their hand, which is really, really strong. It's just kind of spooky to do that battle damage sometimes. Uh, the nice thing about this is it is a name for another card, which we'll talk about in a second. And then the bread and butter, like the 
main synchro you see people wanting to play this deck for is going to be X Saber Hyunle, which is when this card is synchro summoned, you can select and destroy up to three spell or trap cards on the field, which is honestly just pretty crazy to blow out three cards. Obviously, there's things like Starlight Road and stuff that play around it, but that's why you'll see other tools used to ensure that this resolves. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the main synchros. And then there's one other, which is going to be X Saber Wayne. Some people opt to use this card. It lets you special summon a level four or lower warrior from your hand, which means this can set you up for the likes of a fall troll play, which is like kind of good, but not a lot of people opt to run it. It's a level five. It, it could be good. I, I don't think it's terrible, but extra deck space is really tight in X Sabers, which is why it's a bit difficult. But yeah, that's it for the synchro monsters. And then the last card we need to talk about that you're typically going to see in builds is going to be Gotham's Emergency Call. Gotham's Emergency Call is a insanely powerful card. And sometimes you'll even see people side this against X Sabers because it's effective. If a face up X Saber monster is on the field, so it doesn't matter which field, uh, target two X Saber monsters in any graveyard. Special summon both to your side of the field. This card goes really crazy in the mirror match it makes the mirror match honestly terrifying because for example if you flip a Gotham's emergency call and target two of your monsters your opponent can chain it and target those same monsters if they are running it as well some people side this in against x sabers to like steal monsters from their grave and stuff it can go pretty hard it's, it's honestly a really powerful card but yeah this card just gets you any two uh monsters and that can include like your synchro monsters for example because it doesn't need to be level four or lower uh the only exception to that rule is going to be fall troll because it can only be special summoned from the hand so I, i've seen some people try to bring this back with Gotham's emergency call which would be insane but yeah you're not able to do that but you can even bring back the likes of Gotham's with that you can bring back a Gotham's on a dark soul take a card out of your opponent's hand you know Gotham's emergency call is a really powerful card so yeah those are like the main archetype cards you're going to see there's probably some others we could talk about maybe we'll talk about them a bit later but yeah, that's relatively what you're going to see used in the deck. There's a lot to kind of deal with and play with, which is why this deck can be a bit more complex than others. But they're all just phenomenal and really strong and really fun to play with. So now let's just talk about some of the pros and cons of playing X Sabers. The first is going to be the pros, why I think this deck is so good. And honestly, this deck has a lot of pros. There's a lot of upsides to playing this deck. And at the end of the day, I think that's why it's meta, you know? Uh, the first pro is going to be that it's explosive. This deck can do a whole lot in a single turn and the combos it creates are just absurd. Like they can do a ton of versatile options and they also are just all very, very powerful combos. The second one is going to be that all monsters are good independently. I already covered that. All the monsters just on their own as standalone monsters are really strong. Sometimes they're even better than the synchros you can create, which is really powerful. They also are all earth monsters, which means they have access to the earth synchros like Naturia Beast and Barkeon, which not a lot of decks have access to, but that makes it really powerful. And then it also has very favorable matchups into trap oriented decks. So for example, heroes, TG and grave keepers, those decks all are relatively weak to X Sabers, especially depending on how you build it. It can just be a for sure easy win in game one. So this deck is really, really powerful at blowing those decks out, which not a lot of decks are, which is why this is a really nice counter when you're, if you're, especially if you're playing in a locals where a lot of people are on heroes or something like that, this deck is going to be doing wonders for you in those types of environments. Um, and then the last one, this is kind of a relevant thing to talk about because I see a lot of people say that X Sabers are super weak to max C, um, but in my experience and my, you know, just in my experience of playing the deck, I feel like this deck is not weak to maxi at all. There's a lot of ways to play around it. And the big one is going to be, you can play during your opponent's end phase. A lot of cards let you summon monsters during your opponent's end phase. And then there's a lot of uncertainty on how far you're going to take an extension after that fact. So for example, you can Gotham's emergency call back a bunch of monsters during your opponent's end phase. You can reinforce truth during your opponent's end phase, which is going to special summon. So the cards like this are going to let you set up monsters on the board. And then since fall troll is an inherent summon, if you start your turn with two X sabers on your board, your opponent basically has to slam a max C to make it worth to like potentially see value on hitting the fall troll. And if not, then you're basically just going to start synchroing. So like it really just puts them in an awkward spot. And again, since all the monsters are standalone, really good, it's super easy and super comfortable nine times out of 10 to only synchro once, or even just pass your turn because of the fact that you don't really need to worry about it. So for me, 
I can't really, I don't really feel like this deck is weak to Maxi. I feel like I'm very comfortable playing around it. And anytime I've been hit with Maxi while playing this deck, it hasn't been brutal. There are very few windows in which this deck gets hurt by it. And that window is going to be basically off of Bogart Knight. That, <laughs> that's when it hurts. <laughs> but other than that, the deck is super, super good into Maxi. It really doesn't see a lot of problems. And it just has so many different options of what you can do in a single turn. Moving on to the cons. The deck is relatively weak to interruptions and negations, so the likes of like Solemn Warning and Torrential Tribute, the deck can really struggle against things like that, uh, which is also a lot of times why people, you see people running like Decree, Trap Stun, or even, you know, Seven Tools in the main deck. Those cards really, really hurt you if you go for an extension and kind of get stopped. Uh, you're also weak versus Chaos or easy to summon boss monsters, so like BLS, Sork, or Hyperion. And then you also have really awkward mirror matches, and I'd say this deck is really easy to misplay. That's one of the biggest things about this deck, is this deck is actually very tough to pilot. There's a lot of lines, and it's super easy to mess up a single position in the game and then just lose because of it. So this deck is very complicated to play, but again, the payoff is really, really powerful and strong and also a lot of fun. All right, so now we're gonna talk about your typical X Saber build. And this right here on the screen is my personal build. Now I recently took this to a tournament in Nebraska. I went undefeated with it up until the last round. I actually had to forfeit my match before even playing it because I had to leave for a personal like family event. But overall this list performed extremely well and this would still be my current list for the deck. Uh, you guys haven't seen this and it's a pretty spicy, so there's a lot to dig into. But the biggest thing to know about how people typically build X Sabres is you're commonly going to see it as a deck that's main decking triple decree and very few traps, or it's going to be main decking a bunch of traps and no decree. And those are two very different play styles of build, but I'm going to kind of, I'll show you examples of both of what I think would be ideal, but I'm going to kind of give my case on why I personally think that the decree build is just far and away better. I feel like a lot of people haven't caught on or won't recognize why this build is so much better. So we'll kind of break down my logic or line of thinking as to why decree is just so important for X Sabers opposed to some of the other commonly played cards you may see. But first, let's just start talking about my monster lineup. This is really important. So we're going to kind of take it card by card. You run two fall troll because you do not want to brick on fall troll. Uh, basically two is the standard ratio. You're, you saw it historically and you still see it today. You theoretically Theoretically, could bump it up to, to three if you want to be a bit extreme, but I would say it's definitely not worth it, in my opinion. Uh, one Bogart, I already talked about this, because it can only synchro into X Saber monsters, it's very limiting on what you can do, and it's also the most vulnerable monster to Max C. Then we have two Full Helm Knight. Um, the reason why we're on two Full Helm Knight is because I wanted to utilize the toolbox of reinforcement of the army. Instead of, basically, I kind of realized I would oftentimes open multiple Full Helm Knights and it didn't really feel all that good because they don't really do a lot without like extra resources. So I found that the most effective thing to do would be use reinforcement of the army as a toolbox. And that's why you're gonna see other targets in here. Not only can Rhoda get me the full Helm Knight, but it can also get me a copy of Pashul if I need a level two tuner to make like Nat Beast, for example. But I also slapped in some other spicy cards, which is Spell Striker, which I felt like this was the only searchable non-tuner you could get with Rhoda, which I thought felt pretty good because it's a searchable level three earth non-tuner, so you can make Nat Beast with it, and you can special summon it off of searching it off Rhoda. So this just gives you really nice extensions. Also synergizes really well with if your opponent like tour guides into Sangin, you can like normal summon Dark Soul. And then Econ tribute your Dark Souls, steal their Sangin, and then special Spell Striker and exceed, and then get the search. Really, really powerful. So that's why I kind of liked this card. I do tend to side it out in games twos and threes, but I will say that this card is overall, like has tested really well for me. Um, I know a lot of people know I like to mess with it. You could in theory cut it, but I personally like just having the toolbox within Rota. And then the last card I have in here is TG Striker. What I like about TG Striker is again, it doesn't use your normal summon. So sometimes you just want to use Rota to search this, special summon this, normal summon Dark Soul, synchro for five, and that gives you a play without having to commit a lot of resources. This deck is relatively normal summon reliant. So I will say that this card has felt really, really nice. So when I'm using Rota, I can search basically either a special summonable earth 
level two tuner. This card also is a target for reinforced truth, which is really good. Or I can search a level three earth non-tuner alongside my other X Saber monsters, which are available still. So I really liked having these cards in the deck. I feel like TG Striker definitely came up more than Spell Striker, but both the Strikers I think felt really nice to run. Um, but again, you could like I, I would definitely make a bigger case for TG Striker being really strong. The nice thing about it is Hyunlei requires one tuner, one or more non-tuner X Saber monsters. So you can like special striker, then you can normal summon Bogart and special summon another, like a full home or something, and you can synchro for six into Hyunlei. Let's you do different like unique plays, which I think is really good because you can still make the the Hyunlei with the TG Striker. It doesn't require an X Saber tuner, which is really nice. So and then this is the additional X Saber monster in the deck that no one really plays or they play lower counts on. And I've like slowly been increasing my ratio on this card as I've been going. Uh, Super Nimble Mega Hamster. This card is honestly incredible. The biggest thing downfall I found while playing X Sabers is there were so many times where I would open a hand of all tuners, no non-tuners, or more specifically, I just couldn't get access to Dark Soul, which is the most important card in the deck. You want to be cycling Dark Soul as quickly as possible, and you want to be using it as much as possible. So outside of just Emmer's Blade, there's really not a lot of tools that are going to get you to the Dark Soul aside from hard drawing it, which is why I really, really like Super Nibble Mega Hamster. I think this is arguably one of the best turn one plays you could have in the entire deck. A lot of times what I would do is I will set the Mega Hamster, set a Decree and a Reinforced Truth, and then my opponent will summon a Tengu, attack into the Mega Hamster, I'll special summon Dark Soul, and then end phase, I'll Reinforce Truth, special summon out a Pashul, and then decree and so i turn off my opponent's ability to stop me with their back row and then i can either make a trishula for free which will give me a search or i'll have the dark soul plus a pashul which is going to give me the two monsters required to special summon a fall troll and i can just completely go off and i still haven't even used my normal summon which is why this is so powerful because most of the special summoning you special summon both dark soul and pashul during your opponent's turn you're basically playing under maxi very effectively because if you go into the start of your turn and they just slam a maxi well just make a nap beast or a cataster and search and you know the, the maxi doesn't really do anything so it's really really powerful it lets you play on your opponent's turn and do all kinds of things like that so you're playing around the maxi then the other card i need to talk about is because we're on three super nibble mega hamster i'm on a single copy of raiko now raiko is just there as a toolbox because we have so many of these there are so many times points in a game where your opponent has like a thunder king and maybe you can't deal with it and you certainly don't want to summon dark soul off thunder or, or off super nibble mega hamster while they have thunder king so what i would do is i would just get a raiko other times you sometimes maybe just want to flip the mega hamster preemptively so then you can play around your opponent's gores so you can like synchro with this and go into like a Urbellum, and then your opponent like and then you have a set Raiko so you can put a card back and then if they gores then you have Raiko to deal with it which is pretty cool um there, there's a lot of different unique aspects of it but i like this as just a spicy one of just because we have three mega hamsters so it's a nice secondary option to dark soul and then lastly i already talked about the weaknesses of the deck being that it's weak to spot removal through like easy to summon boss monsters like Chaos Sork, BLS, and Hyperion. Even things like Caius can be really powerful. So I will say that Effect Veiler is a mandatory three of in this deck. I think it is so critically important. And then it, like you just need it so you don't get blown out by random stuff. I can't tell you how many turns in this with this deck. I will literally just set a single monster and pass knowing that these monsters are just going to float into something that's going to stall. Typically, it's going to be a pashual. You can either set a monster or just set a single reinforced truth and pass. And then when your opponent goes into battle phase, there's not a lot of destruction that happens in the battle phase. So like... You're typically not going to get blown out or OTK'd if you just summon a Pashul and let them sit there and do nothing with it. So that's why I really like having Triple Effect Veiler because the only way to out a lot of these cards like Pashul or Emmer's Blade or even the Mega Hamster is they have to go into something like a Scrap Dragon or a BLS and Effect Veiler just is so, so handy in that scenario. As well as the other thing that makes the Decree build so good is once you activate Decree, you can easily make a Naturia Beast and if you have... If you have Naturia Beast on field with the Kree, then you turn off your opponent's spells and traps, and they can't out that without exactly basically like Tour Guide going into a Leviathan Dragon, and Effect Veiler also is going to be really important for that too. So now let's talk about the spell lineup. The spell lineup is really spicy. I already talked about Reinforcement of the Army. We're using it to toolbox out the useful cards. 
Heavy Storm, pretty self-explanatory. We don't want to play in the back row. Creature Swap, this is strictly for Emmer's Blade. One really important detail to know about Creature Swap is if you swap your opponent a Dark Soul, Dark Soul has to be sent from your side of the field to get its search effect. So a lot of people will tend to misplay that. But I really like this card, especially because we're on Hamster. You can flip Hamster, special Dark Soul, then Creature Swap it to your opponents. I side this out if I'm going first, and then I side it in if I'm going second. So, because this is one of the most powerful going second turns, especially when your opponent, oftentimes it's just going to turn one summon a Thunder King. You can just creature swap and steal it. Dark Hole is self-explanatory. Monster Reborn, same thing. Mind Control as well. Book of Moon is honestly mandatory in this deck. It's similarly to the fact that enemy controller is putting a monster in defense so you can get things back with full helm knight is really powerful turning off thunder king stuff like that all really great so and it's a it's a nice like reactionary card to like you know flip a set a tuner on your opponent's turn especially when you have decree up because you are very limited in responses so this is mandatory my body is a shield is just so important because as i've talked about a torrential tribute a dark hole something any type of thing that can pop your monsters especially during your opponent's turn so you can't stall with them just brutally hurts the deck so i really like my bodies of shield just for the safety i oftentimes will set this just to prevent my board from being broken or i like having it in hand just for when my opponent could have a torrential set this card is really strong i definitely would recommend using it it has came up it's super nice versus cards like hyperion where they're forced to either just pop your back row and leave your monsters which gives you time to respond on your next turn or if they try to target your monster then you can pop their hyperion also, a really fun fact that I ran into with this deck is it says when your opponent activates a spell trap or monster effect that would destroy a monsters on the field, so it doesn't have to be your field, pay 1500 life points, negate the activation, and if you do destroy it. So I ran into a situation where my opponent had Scrap Dragon and they targeted their Tengu and then my back row card, and which was the my body, and I was able to respond with my body because they were destroying a monster and it was their own monster. You can protect your opponent's monster, so you can play around Scrap Dragon with this card really nicely as well, which is really, really cool. So that's a really unique interaction I've had come up with it, but it is relevant. And then lastly, Enemy Controller. This is like the most important card. It's just so versatile. It does so much in the deck, especially when we're on a uh, triple hamster. You flip a hamster, you summon a Dark Soul, and then you can like tribute that set Dark Soul to steal a monster and synchro with the hamster or exceed with the hamster. Like for example, you can flip hamster, get Dark Soul, and then tribute it and make a it, take their, your opponent's Tengu, exceed with it. It just does so much stuff. It can steal games like crazy. And then also at its core, if you go into something like Decree plus Nat Beast, where your opponent can't sp play spells and traps their only way to out that naturia beast is going to be summon something big and attack over it enemy controller will nicely switch it to defense alongside you know the likes of full home knight negating attacks there's just so many options where you don't really need back row to stop what your opponent's doing and this is again why i'll make the case for the decree build i just feel like on their own if you remove trap cards from the pool so if I don't have trap cards and my opponent also doesn't have trap cards, which deck is going to be better? And in most cases, the answer is going to be X Sabers. The monsters of this deck can just deal so nicely with everything your opponent's doing where you don't really need the likes of Solemn Warning or Torrential in your deck to deal with their monsters unless they're on like a very chaos heavy or Hyperion deck, you know. And even then, this deck still functions pretty nicely without access to it. So, so yeah, like just... In an isolated, in a vacuum, X Savers on their own are so powerful that they don't really need to be supplemented by trap cards. You really just want to ensure that they get to do what they want to do, and you don't really care about what your opponent's doing as long as you just have minimal counterplay tools, which this deck has a ton available through the likes of Enemy Controller and stuff like that. So then the only other two trap cards we need to talk about is going to be Gotham's Emergency Call and Reinforced Truth. This card is insane because it's like chainable, so... Oftentimes, like I said, in this deck, I'm almost never setting anything. I, even my spells like Enemy Controller at Book of Moon, I almost never set them if I have access to like an Emmer's Blade or a Paschal, or if I know my opponent doesn't have a set card, I can just set Reinforced Truth and pass because if they Randy Space, I just get a special summon the Paschal. So they can't really do anything, you know? There's a lot of ways to just stall your opponent's turn and force them to do something. If they need to out it, they're going to typically have to out it in main phase two if you summon like Paschal during their battle phase, stuff like that. So it's super easy to just kind of stall. So that's why I like this card because it's a chainable card. A lot of my turn one plays are going to start by setting Decree and setting Reinforced Truth. If they Heavy Storm, I chain Reinforced Truth and then they, re they one for one my 
decree. If they don't heavy storm, then during the end phase, I summon, I activate the reinforced truth and then activate the decree. So I'm still playing on their end phase, getting monsters for free. This card is like, I, I'd say mandatory, no matter what build you're going for. I think this card is so, so good. And then lastly, Gotham Z call is in here as a tool because it is the most explosive. And as I mentioned, there's ways to use this card. Even if you have decree active, if you synchro into a Hyunle while you have decree, you can target to your opponent's back row and your own decree pop it and then activate Gotham's emergency because Hyunle is going to be a X saber name on field which is obviously really insane so some other cards that people like to mention instead as alternatives to decree are going to be trap stun uh, and the biggest issue that trap stun has comparatively to decree is decree is permanent which means your opponent is never going to be able to play traps as long as this is on the field but trap stun is for a single turn and what you'll often see is if you flip a trap stun to make an extension your opponent's just going to activate max c in response to that trap stun which means like because you're kind of showing your hand that you need to make an extension with decree you can kind of play vague like your opponent isn't going to know when you're going to go off which is why trap stun just isn't that good it's it's definitely way less viable than something like decree because decree is permanent and it just really opens up your options your opponent basically has to mst this and again if they're using msts on your decree then these cards become live and that's also really powerful but this is why we run such a small trap count because you don't want decree to cripple your own cards and you certainly want these cards to be playable before the decree is flipped so that's kind of my my case for that and then the other card we need to talk about is going to be seven tools so Seven Tools is probably the best anti-trap card that is in the trap version of the deck. This card is nice because it'll play around the Solemn Warning and Solemn Judgment opposed to Trap Stun, which like can't respond to them. So you have to preemptively flip a Trap Stun. Seven Tools can react to your opponent's Judgment or Warning, which will let you go off. So this card is probably mandatory in the trap version if you don't want to run decree but again i just think the decree is so worth it the other arguments i've heard against decree is people talk about how you know it has it means you have poor game ones going into agents or chaos and stuff like that and i would just view this the same as running three mst in a heavy storm because we're not on mst in the main deck and you, you definitely want to play around back row. You don't want to deal with them. Some of those decks even run back row. So like if you run into agents, some of them are on copies of warning and stuff like that. And I would say if this prevents a single warning from going off and lets you combo off, then it is absolutely worth being in the main deck. Even if they're on a low trap deck, you can side this out for the likes of MST. And this is also why we're on solemn warning, chaos trap hole and torrential in the side. This, these cards are going to give you the ability to play traps later. So if you know your opponent isn't on a ton of them, you can side this out, just like going against Frog Monarchs or whatever. But I'd say generically speaking, most decks are at least on Solemn Warning and Torrential Tribute alongside Judgment, which is why the Decree is worth it just for that because of how crippling those cards can be for the deck, opposed to anything else. Like if, if you just prevent it and go off, you're going to win. Like I said, if you isolate the trap cards, you know, the monsters and spells are going to do way more for you than any other deck in the format. And then one other important factor in regards to having a weak matchup against things like agents or chaos in game ones is I would honestly argue that because they're not on any back row, even if as long as you don't heavily see a ton of decrees in your opening hand, you're really not going to have an issue because that means you're going to effectively be able to go off and perform with your deck without any concern about any response from your opponent. So if that's the case, you're probably going to have a decent chance at winning that game. I really wouldn't say this impacts my game ones against agents. And I've seen plenty of agents lose game one to X Sabres running decree in main. I don't think it's like that impactful. It just can be a slight down side in that specific matchup but alternatively i can say that decks like tg gravekeepers and heroes i have straight up just one game ones out the gate off of flipping a decree for example at my recent tournament i played in my opponent was on heroes and he i turn one set decree and a monster and passed and he ended up setting five back row and passing and he had double warning judgment and i end phase decree and i honestly didn't even have a follow-up play but because he set five traps he just scooped which is just it can just win you random games in certain matchups so 
while yes it can also be bad in a few it's also really really good in a lot and it's like generically speaking it's good against most decks on an even playing field like tengu plants and all of them they run some degree of traps against heavy trap trap decks it's almost an auto win in the matchup going in game ones especially because a lot of those decks don't main deck mst so you can just blow them out and win with this card right out the gate and then again some matchups it can be bad but it's only going to be bad if you see a ton of them in your opening hand and in that case again you're just going to side out so you might take a unfavorable game one against the likes of agents or chaos but aside from that it's really not going to be that bad and again if it stops a single copy of warning that your opponent's on so if that agent deck is on warning or something it's still worth it just because it's going to let you go off and hopefully win the game that's why I think Decree is just far and away the best. But yeah, we'll look, we'll take a look at the extra deck. So for the extra, we have Utopia, we have Leviathan Dragon, we have Xaver Gotham's. I, I guess I should touch on Leviathan Dragon. Leviathan Dragon is there because I found a lot of scenarios where stealing your opponent's Sangin or something and exceeding with it is optimal. This actually has come up quite a bit for me recently, which is why I'm actually a big fan of this card now. I initially wasn't on it. Then we have an X Saber Gotham's. This is kind of mandatory. Trishula, also mandatory. Scrap Dragon, Stardust Dragon, Black Rose, Urabellum. This card isn't necessary, but I do think it's really powerful because it gives you access to a name. And I do like its effect, uh, but having access to a level 7 name that's going to allow you to Gotham's Emergency Call is just really, really powerful. Uh, and this card is really summonable with the likes of Nibble Hamster. You flip summon it if they don't attack it, you get the Dark Soul, and then just summon Full Helm Knight and Synchro. Uh, and then you have Urabellum, which is going to give you a name and going to apply pressure if your opponent's trying to play slow. And then Nashuria Barkeon, this card's just good to deny traps. Orient Dragon, I would say this card is mandatory in the extra deck because it's so easy to make a level six, and this card just not having to discard to like bounce like with the likes of Bryanak makes it so so powerful. It's so easy to make level sixes. Two Hyunlei, it's pretty self-explanatory. You want to pop the back row. And then one Naturia Beast, one Cataster. Those are both pretty self-explanatory as well. Again, Naturia Beast with Decree can just be a win con for some decks uh, versus some decks. Like, for example, Heroes, if they don't have exactly Honest, they're not going to be able to deal with that. And if you have ways to prevent attacks and can attack over their monsters with other things, you don't even have to worry about the Honest, which is why it's really, really powerful. It's so hard for them to deal with. Um, and then onto the side deck, uh, Maxi, it's a three of in the side. I played this in tournament recently and I didn't side it in once, although I played against a lot of heroes, basically only heroes in that tournament. So, um, that's why this card wasn't sided in, but you know, it's definitely good for the matchups. It's good in to debunk. Uh, this is just, if your opponent's siding heavy hand traps for you. Um, I like it also against decks that are running like Gores and Trag and stuff like that. This plays around that nicely. Uh, and then because, again, since we're on Triple Decree and Heavy, your opponent is going to see that. And then they're going to typically side out their back row hate, which means the you can side in, like side out your Decrees and side into some Trap hate. And that's also why these MSTs and Lances are in here, is if you opt to side out Decrees, you can side in things that still respond to back row nicely, but are a bit more versatile. So if you don't think they're on a trap heavy build, but they might be running their own copies of MST or things that you want to deal with, then this is really nice. I also will side out Decree if I'm going second sometimes and side in MST and Lance because those are more responsive while going playing into my opponent's turn one board because uh, you typically don't want to spend a whole turn setting a Decree and letting them like, you know, MST it or whatever. Um, these are just a bit faster. And then Lastly, to Thunder King. The main reason why I'm on to Thunder King is because I felt like this was the best card to deal with generically everything, and it specific, specifically is really good against Car Curry. As you can see, I'm not on Cyber Dragon or Chimera Tech because Car Curry is kind of a rare deck to run into, and I figured even if it is, I'd rather just have Thunder King, and you already have. Uh, or I'd like to have Thunder King just because it's more generic and it doesn't take up so much space inside an extra, and then also. You know this deck has an inherent advantage into into car curry because a lot of them switch battle position so you can attack into them and you know get monster effects off full helm and stuff like that so i feel like this deck can play into car curry pretty nicely independently and even just by putting in thunder kings plus warnings and torrential with three valor in deck you're gonna have a pretty solid matchup into car curry anyway so i don't think it's a huge deal but yeah that's what the main deck is. I, I, I'm sorry it was such a long explanation, but like there's just so much to get into with this deck. There's so much to talk about. 
and especially in regards to royal decree this card is like so controversial but to me i just feel like it is absolutely necessary um and now we'll talk about real quick what i would like i built my own version of this deck if i was playing x sabers with traps and this is the build i came up with i haven't tested this personally but this is a very similar looking list to what you see if you did like a post side with my other x saber deck we're basically just running this very similar monster lineup except no striker no rota i wouldn't play around that because you need you don't have as much space or wiggle room so you need the traps so i opted to run warning i didn't want to run judgment because there's a lot of times where you're crashing with your emmer's blade to summon something better so if you're i didn't want to lower my life points that much that's why we're, i'm fine with two warning and then you're also on seven tools so that's a lot but even with all that, these are probably the best responses, like generic responses to what your opponent's doing. And I just felt like not having judgment was ideal. So this is like what my trap version looks like. But again, I just feel like I'm guaranteeing my stuff goes off if I just cut these for decree. And then if the matchup looks bad for it, I can just side it out. So this, this was my alternative version to the deck for the trap version. Maybe you guys, if you guys want to give this a try, maybe it'll work better for you. But for the most part, I'm going to say that the standard one is going to be the this one right here where I just feel like I feel so confident with this list going into tournaments. It is so powerful and it has tested so well for me in so many different events. I've played this a lot on paper um, with people, even some like really good players, and it's it's just worked out so well for me. So yeah, that that is the deck and how I specifically like to play it. I just want to emphasize once again, in case I did not, which is um, you don't have to set back row with the decree build. You literally only set your decrees and reinforce truth and then Gotham's emergency call when it's necessary. I feel like that's like one of the biggest things that people mess up with this build is they just passively set their econs or book of moons and then they get spaced and it just like ruins them. These cards are way better used proactively than reactively in X Sabers. So just make sure that when you're on the decree build and you're turning off your opponent's traps, don't give them things to MST. The only thing they should be able to MST is your decree or like set reinforced truth if it's chainable, stuff like that. So yeah, just keep that in mind. But that is my list, guys. That, that's what I've been messing with. That's what that's what I'm playing. And hopefully you guys can give this a try and test it out and see and how it feels for yourself. This deck is complex. It's weird to play. But once you get the hang out of it, I, I'm going to be honest, I think it is just one of the strongest decks in the format. It is so, so fun. All right, so now we're gonna just cover some of the combos of X Sabers, and X Sabers are a bit weird because their combos kind of go as far as you really want them to. Like they they have like they just have weird options, and they have excellent stopping points because their monsters are so generically good at just kind of like floating. So uh, this is the main one I built the deck around, which is Super Nimble Mega Hamster Reinforced Truth. The idea is turn one you set both of these cards, and then you pass to your opponent. Then they're going to draw for turn, normal summon their monster, enter battle phase, attack. And then the hamster is going to flip. You're going to view the deck, special summon out Dark Soul. And then when your opponent proceeds to their end phase, you can activate Reinforced Truth. This is going to special summon you out the Paschal. and then you will get to draw for your turn. So now at this stage of the game, you can flip summon up the x -Saber Dark Soul, and you have automatically a Naturia Beast play if you want it, or you can also do Trishula for free right here, uh, which is really strong because this is a Trishula without using your normal summon. This is what I was talking about, about kind of playing on your opponent's end phase. That's why I like building this deck the way it is, is because you can summon most of your monsters during your opponent's turn, and then you don't have to worry about getting max seed for some of the little things. So now you just get to Trishula and banish everything on your opponent's board, which is obviously really strong. Now, another important detail to note about X Sabers is when you're using Emmer's Blade, you don't want to think of this as just a generic recruiter. You want to think of this as I can summon any deck and any monster out of my deck at the cost of my battle phase, right? So Emmer's Blade can basically crashing Emmer's Blade is super common. This is actually one of the scenarios where you are more vulnerable to max C. But like in this scenario here, my opponent has a synchro. Obviously, I can't deal with that. And I have an enemy controller. So what I can do is I can attack into the Tengu. I can crash to, you know, take some damage, destroy it. And then I get to special summon a monster from the deck. This is where I can then go into full Helm Knight and then declare an attack on the Tengu again. And then activate enemy controller, which will switch the Tengu to defense. 
and allow the Tengu to be destroyed, which triggers my full Helm Knight. Full Helm Knight then gets to special summon back a monster. And then I am allowed to synchro summon in the main phase, in main phase two, which is going to get me like an Orient Dragon, for example, to out this, and I'll still get my end phase search, which is also really cool. So that's like another common play you see. I mean, some some degree of that where you oftentimes will see Emmer's Blade be used to crash into something you need more. Sometimes you'll even just crash Emmer's Blade for value to get a Dark Soul just so you don't have to synchro with Emmer's Blade because synchroing with Emmer's Blade feels really bad. Sometimes you simply just crash the Emmer's Blade and then normal summon a tuner and synchro with the Dark Soul just to get that type of value. One other thing to think about, which is honestly kind of interesting, is the fact that Xaver Dark Soul activates in the end phase. This means cards like Thunder King aren't as oppressive as it would be if this was like a Sangin, for example. So the best example I can give of this is if I special summon Striker and then normal summon my Dark Soul and then synchro for five. If I go into a Cataster, for example, and my opponent decides to Thunder King negate it, then the Thunder King will be cleared from the field via my Synchro, which means during the end phase, I'll still get to trigger my Dark Soul, and then I effectively, you know, one for one the Thunder King. So you can basically out Thunder King without much concern of like, you know, like wasting that search, because since it activates in the end phase, the Thunder King should no longer be on the field if you Synchro summon successfully, or even if they trade one for one for the Synchro. So that's another nice thing where this deck kind of nicely plays around Thunder King, where other where it like other decks otherwise fail the other nice thing about thunder king is it has 800 defense so with the likes of an enemy controller you can easily clear thunder king and make synchro plays off of it and stuff like that you can even use dark soul for example you can summon if we just go off this last board we had if you have enemy controller involved with the thunder king you can easily just enemy controller tribute the dark soul steal their thunder king and then synchro with the thunder king and you'll still get the search and end phase as well so that's another really cool thing about x sabers is just its ability to play around problem cards another combo i really like also involves enemy controller and this is why like enemy controller is just such a powerful card in the deck it's so versatile but you can flip summon your mega hamster and special summon dark soul from deck and then since enemy controller just says tribute one monster it can tribute a face down monster so you can tribute the dark soul to steal your opponent's tengu and then you can just exceed with your opponent's tengu and still get the search which is just honestly insane so that's another nice little combo that works with enemy controller and super nimble mega hamster another reason why i just love this card so much Another thing that's really cool with X Sabers is literally with just if your opponent has like tokens or a bunch of defense position monsters, you can literally just build a board by crashing an Ember's Blade. So like if they have multiple defense position monsters and a Tengu, we can kind of play this out. You enter battle phase, you attack, you crash into the Tengu, and then we'll special summon the Full Helm Knight. Full Helm Knight can then attack a token. That token will be destroyed. Full Helm Knight will trigger. You get a special summon back the Emmer's Blade. The Emmer's Blade can then attack into this again. And you can kind of just repeat this process, which is super cool. So, like, you can go Full Helm Knight. Full Helm Knight is going to attack another token. The token's going to die. You're going to special summon back the Emmer's. Emmer's Blade can then attack into the Tengu. And then this time we'll get like a Dark Soul. Since my build's only on two full helm, like that's as far as it can go. But if you had a third, you could bring out a third. Uh, and so we'll just get into a Dark Soul. Dark Soul can attack a, a token as well. And you can just kind of clear a lot of stuff. And then you can go to main phase two. And this board, since, you know, you can like synchro into like a Gotham's, for example, which is like really, really cool. And obviously this gets massively extended if you have a fall troll in the mix where you can like fall troll back a Dark Soul and like get multiple searches in the end phase and take a bunch of cards out of your opponent's hand. But that is just something useful to know is like if your opponent has a bunch of low defense monsters on the field, you can kind of build a board with just an Amor's Blade, which is like really sick. All right. And you know, there's a lot of combos that happen with fall troll, but it really just kind of depends on what 
what's in your grave. So for my fall troll combo, I'm just gonna show you guys the hand loop. This is the play, I mean, and this, it has to run Raggy Gura, and you'll kind of see why this is pretty unrealistic, especially to do a turn one. This would be the only hand that could do it turn one, and it requires a foolish burial, so you already know that this isn't super reliable, but, or I guess in theory, a one for one would work as well. But basically, the combo would be you Foolish Burial and you dump the Raggy Gura. And then you'd have to Normal Summon Bogart Knight and successfully summon Full Helm Knight. And then you Special Summon both copies of Fall Troll. Then you basically Synchro for 9 into Gotham's. And then you use this Fall Trolls effect to special summon back the Raggy Gura, which effect will trigger and add this Fall Troll back to your hand. You then can use the Gotham's effect to tribute the Raggy Gura and take a card out of your opponent's hand. And then you can special summon the other Fall Troll, tribute this one this fall troll and take another card out of your opponent's hand and then you can use this fall trolls effect to special summon back raggy gura which is then going to add back the fall troll and you can probably kind of see where this loop is going from here you special summon you tribute these two you take two more cards and then you end by doing this once again so that's kind of the combo. It's <laughs> it's obviously very gimmicky, but it is kind of cool. It's like a, a weird loop you can do to like enabled and it, it's strictly enabled by Raggy Gura, but again, most people aren't opting to run this card. It, it, it's just it's just a really gimmicky thing you can do. But I did feel like this is one of the best representations of like kind of cool things you can do with like abusing Fall Troll because again, it has to be special summon from the hand, so this is how you play around it by adding it back to the hand. But yeah, that's, that's like one of the main like notorious X-Saber combos, although you're almost never going to see it because it's like... So this isn't necessarily a combo part of the video. This is more of just a generic emphasis on play style. X-Sabers has a lot of complex lines and decision making, which is why I think this is one of the more difficult decks in the entire format to pilot. But the basic thing I want to try to emphasize to you is in certain matchups, you can kind of choose to not do anything, which sounds really, really weird. But I, I'll give an example of recently in tournament, I had a board state very similar to this, which is my opponent had like three plus back row and I had a Stardust Dragon, Naturia Beast and Utopia. And given that I was against heroes, I knew that my opponent couldn't torrential me because I had Stardust Dragon. They couldn't Gemini spark me because I had Stardust Dragon and Naturia Beast. And they also can't Miracle Fusion because I have Naturia Beast. And since I had Utopia on the board, I also knew they couldn't attack over either of these guys with anything. So like they had very limited options, like unless they're on like the Chaos Hero where they could like BLS. That's one of the only things that's going to out my board. So in this scenario, I knew the only card I actually lost to or like could potentially fall fall victim to would be dimensional prison right so if my opponent has a set dimensional prison and they deprison my nat beast or my stardust then i become extremely vulnerable so i literally played out a turn or in in the game i was I'm, I'm referring to i literally played out a scenario where i took two turns to go into barkeon <laughs> just to guarantee that i don't get deprisoned and i could win the game so that's just something to think about, like because this deck is on, and especially on the decree build, where if you can just wait out a decree, sometimes it's better to just play really slow and not chance anything, and then just try to guarantee that you can basically turn off your opponent's spells and traps in the sense of like a hero matchup that's actually hyper relevant. And then there's another strategy you can kind of go towards if you're not against a back row deck. Now, alternatively, if you're against a deck that's like Agents, for example, where they're running very little back row and playing a lot of power monster cards that can kind of blow you out, you probably don't want to play towards the Naturia Beast or Barkeon route, and there's an alternative option, and the option is you play to take your opponent's hand. Using cards like X-Saber Gotham's, you can tribute monsters and try to slowly whittle at your opponent's hands, and especially if you have it in conjunction with a Fall Troll, you could like tribute a Dark Soul, then bring it back, and then tribute again and get multiple searches, and that's how you're going to slowly whittle away at your advantage and try to just remove your opponent's boss monster options you just want to quickly try to snipe out their hand this is also an excellent way to play around gores and this is where patience and like calculated extensions are so important in x sabers you need to know exactly when you can go in for a win or for a winning play and so 
there's a lot of scenarios, for example, where maybe with this a board like this, I would synchro into a Stardust Dragon and I would just use this full Helm Knight to protect my Stardust Dragon from being destroyed, which would then force my opponent to, if they have like Hyperion, for example, if they try to summon it, I can negate the attack. And if they try to pop, I can negate the pop with this. So you basically just have to think about how can I turn off my opponent's options given the matchup I'm in. And a lot of times it involves like, I need to be able to both block an attack and turn off a spell or a monster or whatever it is. I think the biggest takeaway of learning X Sabers is that you need to understand that every single matchup plays very differently. You don't have the same goals in each one and you have to drastically change your game plan for each deck. And if you can get really good at that, then the deck is very rewarding because you're going to be making a lot of extremely intelligent plays and blowing your opponent out. However, it's just very tricky to do, especially if you're new to the deck. I think one of the biggest pitfalls I see people run into is they give the deck a try, they run into a few weird matchups and they don't know how to adapt to those matchups or they just kind of lose outright because they're not familiar with all the combos and things you can do. And then if you're not pushing the deck to its absolute limits, you're not going to feel the reward of winning with it. So it just takes a lot of time, practice and effort to get good at this deck is extremely difficult, but extremely rewarding if you want to put the time and effort into learning it. Typically in my in-depth profiles, I don't do gameplay, but because of just how like weird X Sabers is as a deck, I figured I would give an example match. This wasn't like a meta v meta match, like I was against Fabled, which is a little bit more off meta. But the relevancy of this is I, my opponent saw Maxi and they also saw BLS two out of the three games. So I kind of just wanted to showcase how that looked and what that experience was like, just so you guys can see just like how the deck is supposed to be played at any given stage. So we're going into game one here. Uh, I lose the die roll. My opponent goes first, goes for Upstart Goblin. And uh, I think they weirdly set a Grim Row, which is like kind of odd if they wanted to get the search, but they did. So I just go and I match with a um, with a set Raiko and a set Reinforced Truth. This is like, I, I don't ever set Dark Soul unless I absolutely have to, just because of the risk of my opponent just normal summoning Thunder King and attacking. This is like infinitely safer because for example, if this card, if they like summon a Thunder King and attack, if this was Dark Soul, I lose the search. But if without that Dark Soul being set, I can, and I have Reinforced Truth during the end phase, I can summon a tuner and then I can just normal Dark Soul and synchro with it, which is a lot more reliable because even if they summon Thunder King, as I showed you, you can kind of play through it. So that's an important detail. But here, I, Raiko would cover a Thunder King and then I have Reinforced Truth to try to pop off, maybe make a Naturia Beast, who knows. Um, but I see I'm going against Fabled. He goes for a Grim Row play. Uh, which is going to search Chawa. And honestly, this Fable build was pretty sick. He like was on Phantom Sky Blaster, which was looking kind of kind of filthy. So uh, he he ends up going for Phantom Sky Blaster, which is going to allow him to synchro for Trishula, which is obviously really good. I had the Veiler, which is why I'm going to emphasize again, having three Veiler is super important. The Raikou gets to pop another monster. And I decide to... I take the damage from the Ganashia instead of activating Reinforced Truth because there is a world where he goes main phase two and activates mind control. And so I would rather take the 18 than risk losing to mind control there. So that's why I chose to take the damage and use Reinforced Truth right there. Sometimes it's best to use this in battle phase to try to prevent taking a ton of damage. But usually you want to use this during your opponent's end phase if you can spare the life points. So see, now I go for the Summon of Dark Soul, I get Warninged, and that's fine, because I have another one, so who cares? And so I, in this scenario, my opponent has a pretty big board, I am kind of spooked, I think I could get blown out by some stuff, so normally I don't set the Econ, um, unless I feel I absolutely have to, and so because my board just feels so frail at this game state, I set the Econ, but like I said, normally I would just set the Decree, and in all honesty, maybe holding the Econ was better, because I have the Pashul, um, but I just wanted to guarantee I didn't get like hit for game if he had like BLS or something. So he does have the BLS, he banishes the Pashul, and then he summons Sangin. And I'm counting the life points here, and I'm like, okay, I don't lose. <laughs> so I just like didn't econ anything. And then in this scenario, I top deck a Bogart, which then lets me enemy controller his BLS. Luckily, I had another Dark Soul. So th this Bogart was actually like a phenomenal top deck here. Um, it let me banish the BLS with its own effect and then clear one of his monsters. 
in hindsight, it was probably better to clear the Ganashia here because he can overlay, but I also was like kind of scared of giving him a, a like, I, I was thinking if he has a tuner, then it's like a synchro. And if he exceeds, then he turns off his Sangin. So I didn't like hate either. Keep in mind during the end phase, I'm going to get a search. So that was kind of my logic, but you can make arguments for both. So here I get my Dark Soul search and I search Emmer's Blade. The reason I search Emmer's Blade here, which typically I've said this in other videos, if you don't know what to get, go for Full Helm. But in this scenario, I'm low life points and I don't really have any tools to make anything happen. Like this Bogart isn't really going to do much. Even if I synchro with it, it can only turn into an X Saber synchro. So there's nothing that's gonna be really potent that's gonna like win me the game here, which is why I think it's better to basically use Emmers to stall until I get a better play. And so that's kind of what I'm going with here. Uh, my opponent then just r crashes their Sangin, which is really good. And this is honestly like a Thanos play from them. They, they go for a draw one into a Pot of Avarice, which puts back their Trishula. And you'll kind of see why that's relevant in a second, um, because they managed to go into Chawa. So here I go for... Emmer's Blade Crash to try to out his Synchro. I go for Orient and a Search. I figure this is like one of the best options I have. And I search Pashul because like, basically I'm already very limited options, but if this sticks, then I can summon the Pashul and Synchro with the Orient Dragon and hopefully just make a Stardust and like protect myself. Unfortunately, as you're gonna see, that's not really an option because my opponent has like pretty crazy advantage in this game um, just because they're able to make a second copy of Trishula here because they were able to put it back off of the Avarice, which means I, uh, I'm definitely just going to lose to that Trishula. So I lost the game one, but you can kind of see like how I was approaching the options and what I was thinking. And then we'll go into game two. And in this scenario, now that I've kind of seen that they're not on a ton of crazy back row, I kind of adapted how I wanted to build. So I am no longer playing Decree, if I remember correctly. I decided to pivot to MSTs and lances. And so I start off by setting a by setting a nibble mega hamster and I go for a blind mind control. The reason I blind mind control here is I have a level two tuner, a level three tuner, a level three non tuner. I have a level four, like I have infinite options of levels to basically play with this card. So I can, if, if it's Sangin or something, which is kind of what I was reading, I can just exceed with it. Um, the one misplay I did here is I flipped the Sangin and then I flipped the Mega Hamster first, which this could have got max seed and punished me pretty hard. I, like I would have just given him a plus one. He didn't use his max seed for some reason, but that could have punished me. I should have just summoned the Dark Soul first and then flipped the Hamster later because then it's not a big deal. But yeah, so here I just take his Sangin and I still have a Dark Soul because of my Mega Hamster. So I'm like big chilling here. Uh, I swing in for some damage. If I remember right, yeah, I, I like play into the gores. I don't really think I cared about it. And I also don't assume Fabled plays gores. Um, so then my opponent just oh, draws into a dandelion and sets like, you know, basically T sets and passes. But this is where this is really strong. This is why I wanted to flip the hamster on the last turn is because my board is kind of offensive. I knew my opponent would be playing defensive. So here I can just flip summon and normal summon Pashul. And I just get to make a free Trishula regardless of that max C. It doesn't do anything. In fact, it like barely accomplishes anything since I'm banishing everything anyway. Um, so I banish the Dandelion and a uh, card of his hand and grave. And uh, because of this, I'm able to just basically win the game. And so now we're moving on to game three. And my opponent once again opens BLS. So again, this is like the biggest problem card for the matchup. As you guys can see, uh, we're just kind of going for an upstart goblin, which is fine. Um, I flip summon my mega hamster. It gets max seed, which is another great reason why this card is so good. So I'm just like, okay, fine. I don't need to make a play. I'll just have the mega hamster attack over his set, which was the Sangin. So here comes Chawa. And again, like I said, I've pivoted out of the decree build at this point. So I have warnings because my opponent is clearly paying a more chaos oriented build. So, um, the decrees are out and we got like MSTs and warnings in. And so my opponent goes for that same Chawa play into Phantom Sky Blaster. But I, the nice thing about it is I know my opponent feels relatively safe because they saw me on decree and they really haven't seen any back row from me in game one or game two. So they're going to go for this Phantom Sky Blaster play and then they synchro for nine into Shashula. 
and this is where I saw him warning. Again, because I know how my opponent's deck plays, like I, once I realized that they're playing very explosive and playing very fast, that's why I also set my Book of Moon. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done that either. I thought if I could maybe prevent a tuner, this would help me. Um, I definitely wanted to get the Trishula out of the way, so I wanted to warning that. So my opponent goes for Glow Up Bulb here to get a level 8, and they decide to opt for a Stardust Dragon. They synchro with everything, make Stardust Dragon an attack. I Book of Moon here because I want to guarantee that I can out this Stardust Dragon. So if if this is set, then on my next turn, I'm just going to go for a Trishula with the Dark Soul and Mega Hamster. And if that card's warning, which it was, uh, then I have Dark Hole as follow-up because the Stardust Dragon will be set. So no matter what, I guarantee I out Stardust Dragon is, is kind of what I was thinking there. So it plays out exactly as I planned, you know, we get, we go into this, which honestly, the warning doesn't hurt that bad because the Dark Soul came off Mega Hamster, so it literally was like a one for one. Um, and then, as you can see, on my last turn, I end phase searched a Fall Troll with that Dark Soul search, knowing that my opponent doesn't have back row and I even have Heavy Storm. So now I can just set up with this Bogar Knight, I can set up for my Fall Troll play, knowing my opponent has used majority of their defensive tools. And so this is where I can start planning to win the game. So I go for my Fall Troll and I use its effect to bring back the Pashul. And here I'm thinking, okay, I just want to, I just want to turn off my opponent's options. I attack into their set monster. I try to do as much damage as possible. And then I synchro into Naturia Beast and set to pass. And so I set enemy controller in this scenario because again, I can't get heavy stormed. I can't get MST'd. And so I need to try to protect this Naturia Beast at this stage of the game. So everything gets set. And then this is where they have the BLS. That's like worst case scenario for me. And they banish my Naturia Beast and even have Pot of Avarice, which seems like obviously really terrifying. But see, now that it goes back to my turn, that was the only play they had was to out the Naturia Beast. I can then just Heavy Storm and Chain Enemy Controller and Tribute my Bogart Knight to have a no risk guarantee steal the BLS and just win the game. So like, I, I like this replay for the sole purpose of the fact that this this scenario right here, this uh, like BLS is one of the biggest problem cards for the matchup, as you guys can see. And, you know, I was getting hit with like Trishulas and BLSs and we were still playing through it without basically any back row until post side. And it really just wasn't that impactful. Um, obviously, we sided in this, like the, the warning. So it's like two warnings and a chaos trap hole for game game two and three. But, you know, it, it's just basically showing that this deck can do a whole lot of stuff with a very little amount. Enemy Controller is a tremendously versatile card if you just know what you're doing and are, like, thinking out about what your opponent's options are. So, yeah, that, that's just a gameplay example. Hopefully that helps. Again, I know it's not meta v meta, but this is, like, one of the most recent replays I had for this deck. So I just figured I'd show it. I felt like the match was really good, and I think my opponent did play really well given the circumstances. Um, we also, you know, we dropped the Tengu Plant Discord here, you know, right here to, to advertise, to bring the boys in, you know. So if, if you want to come play, you know, you make sure you come click that link. You know, we'll put it in the description. Uh, but, yeah. All right, before I wrap up this video, I just want to talk about a few honorable mention cards that, you know, maybe you want to tamper with that honestly still have some viable options. Giant Rat is a big one. This one was seeing a ton of play, and I think a lot of people still opt to run it. I just personally think Super Nimble Mega Hamster is just the better version of Giant Rat. Instead of relying on it to get destroyed by Battle and Float, which a lot of times your opponent is going to try not to attack, Mega Hamster allows you to do something proactive where you can flip summon the Mega Hamster, get a Dark Soul or a Raikou from your deck, and then synchro with it, or creature swap it, or whatever. I just think Mega Hamster just does what Giant Rat does a bit better, especially since you already are going to have Emmer's Blade in the deck. But this is still a viable option, especially if you want to go more heavy on like creature swap, stuff like that. There was a historical list that topped running like triple giant rat, like multiple creature swap and all that kind of stuff. So that's just something to think about if you're into that type of build. And then the other card I want to talk about is going to be X Saber Guard Strike. This is a really weird one, but it says if you have two or more X Saber monsters in your graveyard and control no monsters, you can special summon this card from your hand. So it's an inherent summon 2100 beater 
that plays off of just having X Sabers in the grave, and it doesn't really take long to set up your grave. So this is kind of a neat like one of card or something that you can maybe tamper with. You could special summon it and just like it, it's kind of like almost like uh, a Bogart, but a bit better because you can special than normal, and then you still have the option to special summon a Fall Troll. So. This card's just weirdly potentially viable, so it's something to think about. And then another thing is, is Revelry of the Warlords really hurts this deck. Uh, it's like super bad because as you can see, like a lot of the monsters have different types. We have like Beast, Insect, Warrior, Beast, Warrior. Um, but the biggest type that you're going to have or the most common type that you can fully use is going to be Warrior. So if you get locked under what Rivalry, you have like, you have Pashul, you have Fall Troll, and you have Full Helm Knight. Galhad gives you a non-tuner that's level four, and this enables you to synchro into your warrior X Saber Synchro, so Hyunle, which could out a rivalry. So this card like is weirdly niche. I, I've heard some theory craft of this being like a counter side card to rivalry. I don't know how much merit there is to it. It also does gain quite a bit of attack. Um, it's kind of like a steam gyroid effect almost. It's it's like a, a little weird. Um, and it also lets you tribute other X Sabers to negate attacks. It's <laughs> super bizarre card, but it is niche and could potentially be useful, especially in regards to Rivalry of the Warlords. And then the alternative to that is Goes and Match. This card is a phenomenal card for X Sabers. All the monsters are Earth. Literally every single one of them is Earth. So this doesn't hurt you at all. Majority of the synchros you go into are Earth. So this is going to lock your opponent out really hard. I see a lot of people side this in X Sabers. I personally don't um, because of like the fact that I think floodgates are a bit unreliable in a deck that like is like running decree stuff like that but I definitely see the merit in it if you want to go for that route so goes in is another really powerful card to talk about and then one other card I want to mention just because I think this has confusion is X Saber Souza this card was not out in Tengu Plant format so it is not playable but I sometimes see people see this card and be like wait this card's really good and they want to play it so just know you cannot play this card it is not legal in Tengu Plant format it comes out a bit later this card is good but yeah it's it's not playable so just just know that if you're thinking about playing this deck I feel like people see that and they're like why is no one playing this card <laughs> so that's just something to keep Keep in mind. All right, so this is the part of the video where I want to talk about the deck strength versus the deck difficulty. And as far as X Sabers goes, I would say this deck is a 9 out of 10 in strength. I think it is very, very strong. It has a few weaknesses, like a few bad matchups, but it also has a ton of matchups where it just hard blows your opponent out of the water. I think this deck is super strong and super fun to play. It is far and away my favorite deck in the format to play, so I'd really encourage you guys trying it. But again, to try it, you really got to put the effort in. You got to put the hours in because this isn't a deck you can just easily pick up and play, which is why I'm going to say the deck difficulty is going to also be be around a 9 out of 10. Uh, the only deck that I would say is more difficult would probably be something like Infernity. This deck is easily one of the most difficult decks in Tengu Plant format to play. So if you're up for a challenge, you're a little bored with the stuff you've been playing, this is a really good deck to give a shot to because it's just so strong and so there, there's just so much thought that has to go into each and every turn and so much planning and it's really rewarding if you get good at it, but it also can feel really bad if you don't know what you're doing. So uh, highly encourage it. It's a lot of fun. But other than that, that is going to wrap it up for this video. I know this video has gone on pretty long and I apologize for that, but there's just so much, in, so much information to cover about this beautiful deck. So we're going to wrap it up right here. We'll give a quick shout out to the Patreon. So shout out to Richard, Beast Eyes, Slap God, My Dude, Photo Shooty, Brian Ford, and Sven Olbrahen. Thank you guys so much for the support. But other than that, thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe, and have a great time duel today.